I'm Lindsey Graham, and this is American Scandal. Today, we wrap up our series on corruption in the state capital of Albany, New York. We started the series with the rise and fall of former New York Attorney General and Governor Elliot Spitzer. His very public demise made national headlines and was also the subject several years later of the documentary Client 9, The Rise and Fall of Elliot Spitzer. In 2018, I spoke about that film with its Oscar-winning director, Alex Gibney. In the course of making the film, Gibney interviewed Elliot Spitzer himself and many of his enemies, providing a much richer understanding of the scandal and of the corrosive effects of power, especially in Albany. In addition to Gibney's multiple Emmys, a Grammy, several Peabody Awards and more, he has also won an Academy Award for Best Documentary Feature in 2007 for the film Taxi to the Dark Side, which he wrote and directed. He's the president and founder of Jigsaw Productions and has been named by the New York Times and Esquire magazine as the most important and prolific documentarian of our time. Alex Gibney joins us from Jigsaw Studio in New York City. Alex Gibney, thank you for joining me on this interview episode of American Scandal. Thank you, Lindsay. Good to be here. Your work really spans the gamut from documentaries on Scientology to uh, musicians like Frank Sinatra and James Brown. And you've even uh, executive produced a cooking series on Netflix. So given such breadth, what draws you to a project? What about a subject gets you thinking this needs to be a film? Well, very often I'm drawn to stories um, that look behind the headlines. You know, once the once the caravan of the 24-7 news cycle has passed by, a lot of evidence and a lot of detail and sometimes the very essential meaning of a story is left behind. People have decided what the story is about and they've moved on with a 24-7 caravan. Um, so I'm intrigued at what the real story is and, and, and what people missed. Um, and so in the case of the Elliot Spitzer tale, I found a number of interesting things about it. I was offered this story uh, by a group of people who thought I should take it on. And I was initially uh, not so interested because it just seemed like a garden variety sex scandal. But the more I thought about it, the more interesting it became. I mean, this was the sheriff of Wall Street who goes down just a few months before the world economy explodes. Um, That timing seemed interesting to me. And then the whole idea of There was a kind of murder on the Orient Express quality to this, which is to say that Spitzer was going after some of the titans of industry and banking. uh, And as a group, they end up taking him down. So it seemed to me a pretty interesting story about power and how power really works and how we like to think that people in government are more powerful than private industry. Maybe it's not so. And maybe it's more of a bare knuckled brawl than we think. And then there was the whole issue of Uh, of how he went down, that is to say, the sex scandal. And I was interested in the sexual politics as well as the electoral politics. So for all those reasons, it seemed a very interesting story to explore. In 2007, Elliot Spitzer is elected governor. He spent eight years as New York's attorney general and earned the moniker the Sheriff of Wall Street, fighting corruption in the financial industry. He was a hero for a lot of people and seemed too big. Too big to jail? (laughs) Right. Uh, were you living in New York at the time? Were you an admirer? I, I was in the New York area. I mean, I live in the great and corrupt state of New Jersey, but I work in New York. So, of course, I was intensely interested in what, what was going on in New York. And I, I certainly was an admirer of Spitzer. I thought he was fulfilling an important function. Now, he may have um, been legislating from the attorney general's office, but frankly, I thought he was doing something that needed to be done, which was to hold... Uh, the power of Wall Street in check because um, they were rapaciously violating the rules that we regard, you know, in a kind of idealistic way as essential to the functioning of of good markets and fairness in the economy. Uh, And he was going up and punching a lot of these people in the nose and basically saying, you can't just be 
corrupt. I'm going to I'm going to come down on you and I'm going to come down on you hard because as the attorney general of New York State, I have purview over the financial industry. And so he was one of the few people willing to take them those people on, which I found really interesting and I, I and I think frankly he could have been president. Um he was one of the few politicians uh democratic politicians who polled higher among men than women. Um so because he was a law and order guy, uh, guys liked him and women liked him too because he was trying to stick up for the underdog. So I think he had an opportunity, had he not fallen so far, to become president of the United States. I think he was on his way. But then, of course, just a year after becoming governor, uh, he's connected to a prostitution ring, which really no one was expecting given his law and order background. When when you were researching this and thinking about the sexual scandal aspect, what was interesting about that portion of the story? from a filmmaker's perspective? Was there one single question you needed to answer? Uh, I wouldn't say there was one question, but there were a number of questions. Uh, you know, the first thing was, why escorts? You know, why not have an affair? Or, um, uh, and, uh, and then I also wanted to know a lot more about the world of escorts, because of course the world of escorts, and, uh, and when we say escorts, I mean very high-end, high-priced prostitutes or sex workers. Um, so they cater to the financial industry. And of course, um, as it turns out, they also cater to the attorney general and, and governor. But, um, so, so I was interested in why, um, would a crusading and law abiding attorney general, why would he turn to, uh, an escort service, which is of course illegal in New York state, um, and I, you know, uh, and then I also wanted to know more about it. Like, who was this Ashley Dupre? And it turned out that actually she was not at the heart of the story. She was a rather peripheral character. But I did find somebody who was at the heart of the story. So there were a lot of interesting um, threads to pull on in order to be able to understand the sexual part of the Spitzer scandal. And who was it that you found that you thought was at the heart of the story? We found a woman who's not named. She's called Angelina in the film. But this was a woman who uh, had a great many assignations with Spitzer um, and indeed uh, would travel to meet him while he was on the road, which was one of the reasons that she was in the sights of the uh, Department of Justice, because the Department of Justice, uh, weirdly, was trying to make a Man Act case against Spitzer. Uh, and the Mann Act is a, a much reviled um, piece of a, a legislation which makes it illegal to travel with a woman across state lines for immoral purposes. It's what ultimately nailed Jack Johnson way back in the day. Um, and, and because he traveled across state lines for immoral purposes with this um, escort, who he requested a number of times and ultimately ended up having a relationship with, as opposed to a kind of wham, bam, sexual encounter, which is how he started his experience at the, um, um, uh, at the emperor's club VIP. So that brought me into, um, finding this woman and it took me a long time to get there. When I finally found her, she agreed to talk, but, but not on camera. And indeed, because her voice is distinctive, didn't want to talk on audio. So what we had to do was I recorded extensive conversations with her. I edited them. Uh, and then I actually hired an actress named Ren Schmidt to portray her. And at least initially, that's not disclosed, though ultimately it is disclosed in the film. Another person you interviewed in this documentary is Elliot Spitzer himself, um, and we would like to play a clip here. He seemed pretty candid throughout his conversations with you. Um, of course, uncomfortable at times, though. Here he is talking about the perception of the scandal. It is, to a certain extent, a very classic tale, perhaps of an individual who, from the exterior, appears to have been captured by hubris, a sense of standing for 
virtues and, and I think working very hard to articulate and work towards establishing rules and, and boundaries, but then himself slipping and, and failing. And this is, goes back to the days of Greek mythology. This is not, it's not a new story. He's pretty much just summed up what many people thought, the headline version of his fall. Why do you think he agreed to be interviewed? And when in the interview process did he come to this summary? That was early. And that, that part is very much the controlled Elliot Spitzer. And I had a number of interviews with him. And I think over time, we got a little bit deeper than that. That's Elliot Spitzer talking about himself in the third person and also comparing himself to Greek gods. That's, that's the Elliot Spitzer that's very much the public Elliot Spitzer. Um, I think he ultimately wanted to do, and, but we ultimately got a lot deeper than that, I think. I think he wanted to do this in part, and it took a long time to persuade him to agree to speak. And we were the first people to get him to talk about this publicly. I think he agreed to do it because he didn't want the scandal to be the last chapter. He wanted an opportunity to be able to not just give his side of the story, but to also tell the whole story. So that it was not just a fall from grace. It was a rise and fall story. He wanted people to remember the rise as well as the fall. And so on that basis, um, and I it was interested in that part too. So on that basis, we, we agreed to talk um, and, and talk we did. Over, or, and I think it was a series of five interviews. At the very last one, when we finally finished, he, he turned to me and quipped, so same time next week. Do you think his desire... Uh, to tell the this, the full story, the rise and fall. I mean, it's understandable that everyone will, will remember the fall, and it's understandable that he would want people to know about the rise. It, does he make his case? Was he compelling that that his whole arc should be remembered? Yes, I think he was compelling. I think if you look at his career as attorney general, it was a terribly impressive career in terms of being the sheriff of Wall Street and being kind of the de facto regulator, um, you know, in a system where the SEC and Congress was unwilling to hold Wall Street to account because Wall Street has so much money. If you're a politician, you need Wall Street's money to get elected. Um, Spitzer was very rich. He didn't need their money. Um, and, and, and frankly, the way our economic system is structured, it, 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 it's almost intentional in terms of um, the weakening of regulatory bodies that, that attempt to, um, you know, hold the financial industry in check. Uh, so there was nobody minding the store until Spitzer. So I found what he did in that realm to be very impressive. And indeed, you know, as an attorney general, he did what attorneys general are supposed to do, which was to protect the weak against the strong to look at people who are running scams against people who couldn't afford to fight back, and he would fight back for them. So I found it very powerful. In these interview segments with Elliot Spitzer, he looks like he's sitting on a living room couch. It feels familiar and close. Where was that filmed, and, and, and what was your intention in that setting? I think the intent, we wanted to find a place, and I think that's part of the reason why he said same time next week, we wanted to find a place that was secure, um, I knew I was going to interview him over a, a number of different times, uh, and I wanted control of that space. So um, it was the apartment, um, it, it, was, it was the parents' apartment of one of my producers. Um, and we treated it, and because the, the parents were mostly overseas, we had access to it uh, over a period of time. And we were able to make it into a kind of a set, but we wanted to feel very comfortable, and therefore the couch, and the um, uh, and, and and the decor. It's at both. It's at once both comfortable and a little bit severe. In shooting the Spitzer interview, and frankly, in shooting the Angelina interview with the actress, those are the only two people with whom I use the device called the Tony Tron. It's a it's a device, a series of mirrors you put over the housing of the lens which allows you to be looking at the speaker, in this case, Spitzer, but uh, because he's looking into a mirror over the lens, he appears to be looking directly into the barrel of the lens, which in fact he is doing. Uh, and so that gives it a kind of 
intimacy that's unlike the all the other interviews. So it's as though, though those are the only two people that that have that kind of direct eye contact with the viewer. The title of the documentary is Client Nine. Just briefly, where does that name come from and why did you decide on that? It seemed a little bit like Citizen Kane, but <laughs> in a in, in a very different way. Um, Client Nine is taken from uh, a document uh, compiled by the Department of Justice when they were investigating Spitzer, um, or they were theoretically investigating the Emperor's Club VIP. And in so doing, they discovered a number of clients, uh, certainly clients one through eight, and there were many after nine. Uh, interestingly, the only name that leaked to the press was Client Nine, Elliot Spitzer. Uh, but there, there, there seemed to be something sort of universal about it. He was just Client 9, anonymous, yet at the same time, of course, he was Elliot Spitzer. So there was a certain poetry to it, a certain cruel poetry, I should say. And, and frankly, it was also salacious and, um, and intentionally so, because this was a story about a scandal. But interestingly, you know, Client 9, even that phrase has a number of different meanings. I mean, it's, there's a salacious quality to it because he's a client of, a, of an escort service, but there's a law enforcement quality to it too. And that document is something that the Department of Justice used to leak uh, to, the, um, to various news organizations, particularly the New York Times, as a way of giving them a series of breadcrumbs that they could follow in order to be able to find out that the governor was using an escort service. They did that instead of indicting him, which um, was probably more effective than uh, in, in destroying his political career than indicting him. And frankly, I'm not sure they had grounds to indict him on a federal level. Well, this leads into uh, something I was going to ask you. You mentioned earlier the feds were theoretically investigating the Emperor's Club, and you just seem to indicate that this theoretical investigation was just a means to get to Spitzer. Do you think that's really the case? Yes. I don't think there's any question about it. It wasn't as if um, the uh, federal government, the federal government as a rule, does not take on the busting of um, prostitution rings. You know, city, uh, city attorneys take that on. Sometimes state attorneys take that on but not the federal government, generally speaking. Um, so they were following a trail. And then once they found that the trail led to the Emperor's Club, they began to investigate the Emperor's Club. But it was really following Spitzer. Uh, it was not um, an investigation into a prostitution ring that just happened to stumble on Elliot Spitzer. Now, this, is, this, I should say, takes place at a time when there was a great deal of controversy over whether or not the U.S. Um, Department of Justice was being uh, rapidly politicized by the Bush administration. Uh, and indeed, the U.S. attorney in the Southern District of New York was a man named Michael Garcia, who ultimately, um, I think as a reward for taking out Elliot Spitzer, was rewarded with a partner's position uh, at, I believe, Kirkland and Ellis. You guys would have to check that. But that's a very prominent, if I'm right, and, and you should check it. If I'm right, that's a very prominent, uh, very prototypically pro-Republican firm from which a lot of um, the Republican uh, power brokers um, in legal terms often emerge. Well, this gets to the question of Spitzer's enemies. Certainly, he made enemies of a lot of very powerful and very wealthy people on Wall Street. Um, you would think or hope that the federal government itself has no direct animus towards him, but perhaps the people in installed positions might. You made some discoveries about these enemies of Spitzer, but then left it a, a mystery on who might have been involved in the downfall. Do you have a thesis on, on what happened and who was behind it? Yeah, so I should say two things about this. One is I do have a thesis, um, but... the. I only went as far in the film as I felt the facts would take me. Um, so I go right on up to the edge of the thesis, but I can't say definitively that I know exactly what happened because um, the key perpetrators in this murder on the Orient Express story did, didn't confess. 
But since the film, you know, a number of people have told me that I was right, at least in terms of some of the key um, figures who were in business that went after Spitzer, notably Ken Langone, um, Maurice Hank Greenberg, who was the head of uh, AIG, and Dick Grasso, who uh, who ran the New York Stock Exchange. You know, I had a, uh, I, I had a number of sources tell me that they toasted Spitzer's demise with a magnum of champagne at the 21 Club. Um, and, you know, Langone denies ever hiring private eyes to look after Spitzer. But we know that private eyes were the reason that Spitzer was ultimately... Um, uh, th- 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 that people got enough clues to understand uh, that something might have been wrong. And then, um, you know, through banking records, um, you know, a parallel investigation takes place uh, and the Department of Justice becomes involved. And I do think that there was there was an animus towards Spitzer because he was arrogant. And I think the Department of Justice felt that sometimes he was muscling into their territory and also that he wasn't being... Um, he wasn't observing the proper role of an attorney general. He was trying to legislate from the attorney general's office. So I think there was a certain amount of um, ill will towards Spitzer from the Department of Justice. In addition, I do think there were elements in an extremely politicized Department of Justice who were gunning for Spitzer. So all these people got together. That's why I think Murder on the Orient Express is such a good analogy All these people got together to plunge the knife into Spitzer. But the thing that really takes him... So I think it starts with a private investigation into Spitzer just to see what dirt can emerge. Once a little bit of dirt is revealed, the Department of Justice takes over and and then they produce a thorough investigation, which they then leak to the press. And that, in short terms, is, is how Spitzer went down. One of Spitzer's largest and most public enemy was not a titan of industry, but in Albany, Joe Bruno. He was the Senate Majority Leader of New York for more than a decade, and and certainly during Spitzer's time as governor. They had a bitter rivalry, especially after what became known as Troopergate. Here's a clip from the documentary in which you talk to Bruno about their relationship. You know, what was strange with uh, Elliot Spitzer was he could be pleasant and charming and act very caring. When my wife was reported as being seriously ill, he called me several times. And this is right in the height of some of our worst exchanges. Couldn't have been any more pleasant. But when he came after me in what was called Troopergate, then it was apparent that this man really intended to destroy me. So my first question is, it's obvious that the two of them are from different backgrounds and different political parties. But why do you suppose he and Spitzer had such a hard time getting along? <laughs> well, I do think there are a number of reasons for that. One of them is I think Spitzer was um, in some ways a great public figure, but a terrible politician. Some of his own advisors would tell me with, with great anguish that they could never get Elliot Spitzer to play the political game in which you try to seed with somebody you need as an ally, an idea, even though it's your idea, and let them take credit for it. And once they've absorbed it as their idea, it becomes a lot easier to make it happen. They think it's theirs, and so they take, they want to take credit for it. And Spitzer would always say things like, well, why should I let him take credit for it? It was my idea. And everybody would sort of slap their foreheads like, you idiot. That's not how the game is played. The game is played by making other people feel good. You, it, that was the game that Clinton was so masterful at. And his own way, Joe Bruno, gentleman Joe Bruno, he was great. You know, he's a very charming man. I wouldn't say Elliot, I mean, there are things I find um, charismatic or charming about Elliot, but generally speaking, he's not a charming guy. Bill Clinton walks into a room, he seduces everybody, not so Elliot Spitzer. Elliot Spitzer uses force, and he learned that in, um, in the Attorney General's office. That's not always such a great way of, um, uh, you know, uh, of getting legislation through, particularly in a kind of hidebound environment like the um, Senate and Assembly in New York State, which is deeply corrupt. Um, so, 
uh, he wasn't good at glad handing. And instead, he would punch people in the nose. And he'd be surprised that people would remember that he had punched them in the nose uh, when it came time to cut him some slack. You know, we think about a number of people who went through big sex scandals and survived, including a, a man named David Vitter, from uh, a senator from Louisiana, who ordered prostitutes uh, during roll call votes in Congress. And yet, all he had to do was to pray to God that, um, you know, and, 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 and note to everybody that, that he was a sinner, and, and, but God had forgiven him. And then he goes on with his political career. Uh, it was completely analogous to Spitzer. Clinton would be another one, or John Edwards. Well, John Edwards fell. But Clinton, you know, survived his political scandal. Why? Because Clinton had friends. Spitzer, at the time of his scandal, had no friends. So I don't think he was a very good political player at all. He didn't know how to make friends. He knew how to make enemies. It's 2018, uh, and it doesn't look like much has really changed in Albany since Spitzer resigned. Many of these characters that were instrumental in his fall have fallen themselves. Bruno forced to resign. And just recently, earlier this month, former New York State Assembly Speaker Sheldon Silver, one of the three men in the room with Spitzer, was granted his request for bail and to stay out of prison until his appeal of his conviction of corruption charges. And then you have former New York State Senate Majority Leader Dean Skelos and his son Adam, who had also had their sentencing trial. A lot in the news about the current governor, Cuomo, as well. What, what is it about Albany that, that persists that even despite you know, Spitzer's steamrolling charge to change it, Cuomo's attempt to do the same. Why is Albany corrupt and why is it intractable? That's probably a, a really good question for William Kennedy in terms of the culture of Albany. But I suspect, you know, th that the culture of Albany is as corrupt as it is because um, it's, uh, it's a representative body of a very wealthy state. And yet these people don't really get paid enough to survive. So they're doing, they're, they're sort of businessmen representatives um, uh, who have access to enormous treasures if they play the game well. And, and so you see incredible corruption. Um, and, and it will be surprising if that corruption can be rooted out. You noted properly that a number of the key players in the Spitzer scandal or, or the Spitzer story have become disgraced themselves and fallen. One exception to that is Andrew Cuomo. Andrew Cuomo was actually pivotal in terms of bringing Spitzer down, if you go back and think about it. He was the one who was really riding very hard on the investigation into Troopergate, which, at least in my view, uh, was kind of uh, a trumped-up episode ginned up by uh, Joe Bruno just to make Spitzer look bad. Uh, but I think Cuomo saw his own rivalry with Spitzer as an opportunity to make that more than it was. That's my own personal view. That's not something that's deeply embedded in, in the film. But I would also say this, and it's very interesting to note, that one of the key financial and political supporters of Cuomo, particularly when he first runs for governor, is Ken Langone who is Spitzer's arch enemy, the man who said, um, you know, if, he, if he's going to try to put a stake in my heart, he better make it steel because wood will break. So um, the alliance between Ken Langone and uh, Andrew Cuomo is one that people should probably pay a little bit more attention to. You've had opportunity to interview and converse with a lot of people of power. Albany is a place of power. What do you think it, it is about power that makes people think that they can get away with things? It's an aphorism. It's easy to say that power corrupts, but what's the mechanism of power that, 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 that gets into the bloodstream of these people? I think two things happen simultaneously, and it's a toxic mix. One is when you get a lot of power, you begin to believe your own bullshit. Uh, you begin to believe that you are as great and as wonderful as other people say that you are, and they say that you are because you have a lot of power, you know, surrounded by flatterers, and the next thing you know, you want to believe them. Um, I also think that people with power tend to be on a mission. 
And when you're on a mission, you believe more strongly in the purity of the end than the um, goodness of the means to achieve that end. Um, and you somehow believe that the pure end can justify an ignoble or corrupt means. And so this, this combination of, um, you know, um, a sense of enormous a belief in your own uh, strength of character as a result of those who flatter you, and this sense that the end justifies uh, a ruthless means allows you to be corrupt. I, I think that, you know, whether it's Elliot Spitzer, who imagined that, you know, look, he was doing so much good for um, the people of New York and ultimately the people around the country, surely he deserved a little bit of fun. Uh, and, and, and I think that, um, and, and that he could do as a former attorney, crusading attorney general could engage in activities for which he prosecuted other people. Um, that's a kind of suspension of, 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 a belief that is, is hard to really understand. It's a, it's a sort of extreme cognitive dissonance. Um, but I think people in power um, are afflicted with um, a blindness uh, and a sense of invulnerability that ultimately, interestingly and ironically, often causes them to lose that power. This affliction, this sense of invulnerability, most often infects those in positions of public power, politicians, celebrities, certain flashy CEOs. But there's another sort of power, a, a power you've alluded to, the power of influence behind the scenes and the power of influence of the public narrative. In terms of, in terms of power or in terms of this story, there's an intriguing character that plays a kind of minor role in this film, but who has since played a more fundamental role in the rise of Donald Trump, and that is Roger Stone. It's unclear who hired Roger Stone to tag or target Elliot Spitzer. I suspect it was either Ken Langone or Hank Greenberg or one of their cutouts. But what's interesting about Roger Stone is not only how often and how easily he lies, much like his friend Donald Trump, but also how effective those lies are because they contain an entertainment value that proves so seductive that they then get circulated and recirculated over and over and over again. And it's not worth perseverating too much about this in terms of the specifics of the Client 9 story, but as a metaphor, I think it's terribly important. The whole idea of Elliot Spitzer and his black socks, that is to say the idea that he wore those black socks to bed um, when he had these assignations with, with escorts, is something that was wholly made up by Roger Stone. I know because I talked to the escorts. But it's such a delicious story that even reputable outlets like the New York Times would reprint it. And it's a, a story of incredible political power because it demeans Spitzer. It, it, it makes a mockery. It, it makes a laughingstock out of him. Um, now fast forward to the Trump campaign. When Trump can you know, insinuate and or actually, you know, make up the most outrageous untruths. And yet, because of their entertainment value, they get redistributed and recycled over and over and over again until they have enormous political force. That, to me, is something that's, um, that's scary, uh, but also worth looking at. Um, and, 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 a, and a key feature of the, of the Client 9 film. The other thing I would say, and this is probably going to get me in trouble, but I'll say it anyway. The other thing that I always wondered about the Client 9 story, and I don't know for sure whether this is true, but there's a, another shadow figure that I wasn't able to include directly in the film, uh, and, but that is David Boyce, the, the lawyer, the famous lawyer. David Boyce is the attorney for Hank Greenberg. I always wondered, given what we know now about 
uh, David Boyce reaching out and uh, procuring um, uh, ruthless private eye firms for um, Harvey Weinstein, whether or not that was a job that he was given on the Spitzer case. I have no way of knowing whether it's true. I just, in retrospect, I wonder about it. Yeah, Roger Stone is just a character. And um, I can't believe he's been doing it so long. His tactics, I think you are right, have suddenly become mainstream. They were dirty tricks, but now they're uh, perhaps just the way things are done. That's right. I think that's absolutely right. In terms of a comment about politics, uh, Roger Stone has managed to make um, dirty tricks that used to take place in the shadows of the political arena. He's brought them into the Big Ten. You're a documentarian and filmmaker. Your father was uh, Frank Gibney, a longtime journalist, editor, and author, uh, famous in part for books that looked at power suspiciously, like in communist Poland and, and the so Soviet secret police. How did your father influence your work and your mission as a documentary filmmaker? First of all, my father, I, I think my father influenced me greatly. You know, he was very proud of his um, career as a journalist. Even when he had become a businessman, he was the vice chairman of the board of editors of Encyclopedia Britannica, which, while it had its own editorial mission, was also very much of a business job. Um, but he was very proud of his work as a journalist, both as a kind of a truth seeker and as somebody who was eternally curious. Um, I think also in terms of his career, I I'm afflicted with his same character flaw, which was that instead of the classic road to power, which is to suck up and kick down uh, as you're climbing the ladder, you know, he had a tendency to <laughs> suck down and kick up. And so as a result, he was fired from a number of his jobs at Time, Newsweek, and Life, et cetera. Um, I think perhaps I was wise enough in my career um, mostly to work for myself because I think I would have had a hard time working for other people. Uh, but I think I was lucky along the way in terms of seeing some of my colleagues who in some of their early films were flattered uh, very extraordinarily because some of their early films were, 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 were great and, and much heralded. I had a much longer, tougher road to get to a position of prominence in my career. And as a result, by the time I got there, I wasn't as uh, willing uh, or um, susceptible to uh, believe the bullshit. So I think I had that advantage. And, and I do think, you know, one of the things I think about now when I make a documentary about somebody, and I make a lot of documentaries about abuses of power, and I think the Spitzer film is one of those ones that I'm particularly proud of, because I think I gave everybody their say. You know, uh, Ken Langone, I, I heard him tell other people that he loved this film. He comes out with very different conclusions than I would come out of it with. But he feels I got Spitzer right and I got him right. Uh, and I feel very proud of that. Because it seems to me that you have to make films, particularly when, you, when people are willing to, to um, trust you with their testimony, that you have to be true to what it is they're trying to tell you and to embrace the contradictions of, of that testimony so that you feel you could watch that film while sitting next to them in a movie theater and be able to defend everything that you did. I think that's a hugely valuable exercise, that, 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 uh, that two-seat movie theater exercise where when you're watching a cut and thinking, man, I'm really taking it to this guy right now, you think to yourself, well, wait a minute, what if he was sitting next to me? Would I be able to look him or her in the eye and say, this is fair? That's my test. You've covered a lot of interesting subjects in your career and a lot of interesting people. Just uh, casually wondering here, uh, if you had access and budget and everything you needed, of anyone living today, who would you do a film about and why? Well, and this is an impossible task, but the person I'd want to do a film about is Barack Obama. Uh, but I fear that I would be disappointed because I wouldn't get the Barack Obama that I would want to make a film about. The Barack Obama that I would want to make a film about is one who would be ruthlessly honest. Uh, and I don't think he's prepared, willing, or able to do that at this moment in his career. But I've never seen such an extraordinary mixture of high ideals 
um, and soaring rhetoric. And yet, in my view, um, hugely disappointing um, and craven um, political actions that ultimately led to disastrous policies. And, and he is a guy who knows the difference between the principles and the actions. And so it always made me wonder why he chose the path that he chose. At a moment when he could have gone high, he went low. And yet, at our lowest moment, he was also able to go very high, particularly when it came to trying to unite us, you know, in a, in a, in a moment of great rhetorical flourish. Um, so, uh, you know, if he were to be honest, Barack Obama is the person I'd like to make a film about, but I fear he can't be honest. Well, if you happen to make the film, I will be sure to watch it. Alex Gibney, thank you so much for joining us today on American Scandal. Many thanks. Great pleasure. Thank you so much. From Wondery, this is episode five of five of New York State of Crime for American Scandal. On our next series, we look into one of the largest political scandals of the 20th century, the Iran-Contra affair. It's a deep, complex story with covert operations, secret bank accounts, hostages, arms deals, and a cover-up that implicates everyone, even the Teflon president himself, Ronald Reagan. American Scandal is hosted, edited, and produced by me, Lindsey Graham, for Airship. Additional production assistance for this interview episode by Jacqueline Kim. Executive producers Stephanie Jens, Marshall Louie, and Hernan Lopez for Wondering.